Hey, this is Scott from phasingplayer.com. Now, before I get into the rules for PAX Premier 2nd Edition, let me make something clear about this video. This is not going to be a comprehensive line-by-line -line breakdown of the rulebook. Instead, this is going to be more of a broad overview, trying to get you up to speed on sort of the, the way the PAX system works in relation to PAX Premier 2nd Edition, whether you're a newcomer to the series or just new to PAX Premier. I hope that by watching this, you'll be able to crack into the rulebook and really understand what it's trying to communicate. It is a good rulebook. I think things are pretty clear in it. And hopefully any questions that may come up after this video, you will be able to find pretty quickly. Anyway, why don't we go ahead and set the game up and start from there. Okay, so here is the game mostly set up. I've got the market above the board, all of the ruler tokens placed in their appropriate regions, the favored suit marker put up here on the political marker up top. The participating players have a score tracker sitting on the side over here, ready to go along the score tracker on the map. And then each player has their own player board and on it, all of their cylinders plus four coins to start the game with. Additionally, each player is going to have one of these loyalty dials and they will set it to any of the three empires in the game. You'll do this in turn order, and there is no restriction for which one you pick. So everyone could be British, everyone could be Russian, you could mix it up. It doesn't really matter in terms of what is allowed and what is not allowed. There is strategy to it, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. The only thing I haven't done is set up the market. I'm going to need to separate out the four dominance cards the stack of event cards that look very similar to the dominance cards, and then all of the rest of these court cards. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create six stacks of cards that are gonna be mixed with these three types and then uh, shuffled individually before creating the market deck uh, in itself. So in these six stacks, there will be initially five of these court cards, plus one for each player in the game into each of the six stacks. So in the game I've set up here, I've set up for three players, meaning I'm gonna put down five of these cards and then an additional three on top of that and do that six times. So why don't we go ahead and do that right now? Okay, so now I have these six stacks of court cards. In this game, it'll be eight in each. That's five base plus one for each player. The rest of these court cards can get put back in the box. They will not be used this game. Then in each of these six, I'm going to distribute these four dominance cards and then a few of these event cards. I'm gonna go ahead and label these numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six, okay? This is just for bookkeeping purposes at setup. I'm gonna place these four dominance cards in the last four stacks in this setup. So in this case, numbers six, five, four, and three. So I'm gonna take these and put one into each. Now, I'm going to do a similar thing with these event cards. I'll have shuffled them up, I've already shuffled them, and I'd be doing this face down. And I'm going to put them in a similar fashion, except starting from the rear, I'm gonna put one in number six, one in number five, one in number four, one in number three, and two in number two. There will be none in the first stack. The rest of these event cards can be returned to the box with those court cards. Okay, so now I need to shuffle each one of these six stacks individually and then combine them from six on the bottom to one on the top. So let's do that right now. And finally, number one. Now I don't really have to shuffle number one because it was made up of already shuffled court cards. So you can if you want to, but I'm not gonna bother, and I'm just gonna put it right on top. So now that I've got my market stack here, these are not going to get shuffled again. 
the dominance cards and event cards are gonna be seeded into here in a somewhat random order based on how the individual shuffles ended up. This can get set over to the side of the board and then we can populate the market with those cards. Okay, so now the market is set up, the deck of cards is ready to go. This is now when the players would select their starting loyalties. You set up the market first so that you can evaluate what is in here and that will help guide what you should be setting your starting loyalty as. You'll pick a random player to start, go clockwise from them, and then the final player to set loyalty will begin the game. Okay, so here's Pax Premier all set up. So how do you play? Honestly, the game is pretty straightforward. On your turn, you're going to perform up to two actions. You may perform fewer than that, but you always are allowed up to two. As the game goes on, you'll get access to more actions, but to begin, you will only have two basic ones. The first is going to be purchasing cards from the market, and you will take those into your hand. The second is playing cards from your hand into your court, or your tableau, depending on the term you want to use. To purchase a card, you have to pay coins to the market based on the position of the card you're buying. So let's say it is the blue player's turn, and they decide they want to purchase this Russian Regulars card. To do so, they must determine how many coins they'll have to spend. In this case, it's two because of the two column that is above the card right here. Then they will take the coins and they'll place them back into the market on each card they passed over to buy this card. So for this example, these Russian regulars are in front of Joseph Wolf and Eldred, this is very hard to read upside down. They're in front of this guy, Eldred Pottinger. So, what we're gonna do is put one coin on Old Joe and one coin here on Mr. Pottinger. Then Russian regulars will be taken into the hand of the blue player. Now, for this tutorial, I'm gonna be putting cards that are in the hand below the player board over here. Typically, you're gonna be holding them in your hand, as you might expect. As a personal house rule, I enjoy playing this game with open hands, meaning it is always open information what cards people hold. I think it makes the game less about memorization and more about strategy and tactics, but that is not the written rule. So again, that is a house rule, and for the purpose of this instruction, I'll be putting hand cards over here under the player boards. Normally though, they're hidden. So anyway, that is purchasing a card. Playing a card means taking a card from your hand and putting it into your court. When you do that, you have to consider a couple of things. First, does anyone rule the region that the card is attached to? Every card has its region printed in the upper right. In this case, it's Persia. If a player was deemed the ruler of Persia, then in order to play this card, I would have to pay that player a certain amount of money, depending on the circumstances on the board. If nobody rules a region, then it is free to play the card into your court. Once I've played the card, I will then check to see if the card is attached inherently to any empire. You note that based on the colored band over the, the card's name. In this case, these Russian regulars are, as you might guess, Russian. However, Shah's guard has a white band with no empire symbol next to it, meaning it is not affiliated inherently with any specific empire. If the card has a Patriot band, as it's called, you must change your loyalty to that empire if it is not already that. Additionally, when you do that, you must get rid of any other cards you have that are tied to the loyal empire that you came from. So if they have a Patriot band on them of a different empire, if they have a loyalty prize that you've taken, which I'll get into in a moment, or any gifts that you've given that empire through the gift action. All those things go away and you declare your new allegiance to the Patriot card you've played into your court. Once you've done those things, you then perform any of the impact icons listed on the card. They'll be in the upper right underneath the location of that card. Impact icons will do things like put armies and roads into the map, insert spies and tribes of yours into the game, or even change the current favored suit of the game. It starts on the political track or the uh, political marker, but it may move when impact actions are performed. At this point, 
the card is now in your court and you've performed the play action in its entirety. So as the game goes on, you will get access to other actions. By default, like I said, you have access to purchase and play, but cards will give you access to different actions in the game. Any squares listed out on the bottom of a card are actions that the card will allow you to perform. They take up an action just like anything else, so you have a limit of two actions per round and these count towards that, just like purchase and play. Another restriction of actions on cards is you may only perform one action per card that you have. So even though this card here has three actions on it, I could not perform all of these on this card in one turn. I would choose one to do. There's also the concept of bonus actions. Bonus actions are gonna be dictated by the current favored suit. Every card has a suit on it. And if the favored suit matches a card in your tableau, you may perform the action from that card for free. Now, when I say free, I don't mean free of any monetary cost. Any coins that must be paid, either to players or back into the market, must still be paid. However, it will not count against your two action limit. It does, however, still limit you to one action per card. All right, so succinctly, the other actions available to you outside of purchase and play are build, which allows you to place armies and roads into the map, provided you rule the region you are putting the units into, tax, which allows you to take money out of the market into your supply, or if you rule a region, you may take money from players that also have presence in that region, gift, which allows you to purchase lavish gifts for the empire that you're loyal to, and that will grant you influence in that empire, March, which allows you to move armies along roads or spies along cards in players' tableaus. Betray, which allows spies of yours to kill cards that they are present on in anyone's tableau. And finally, Battle. Battle allows armies and spies to remove units either from the map in the case of armies or from cards in the case of spies. Whenever you perform an action that requires money to be spent, it is not put back in the bank. Instead, that money gets paid to the far end of the market. So if I purchased a gift for two coins, I would place one coin in the bottom row and one coin in the top row on the far side of the market. After you've performed two actions on your turn, you will then do a cleanup. The first thing you must do in the cleanup phase is make sure you are not over your court limit which is going to be a base of three plus one for every rank of purple cards you have in your, in your court. Then you must meet your hand size limit, which is gonna be two plus one for every blue star in your court. Then you will discard any event cards in the leftmost column of the market board. It will activate the text on the if discarded portion of the event. Finally, you fill in any open slots by sliding cards down toward the cheaper side and then playing new cards to fill those slots. If money is on a card that's moving down the market, it stays on the card. If there is money on a blank spot, then it remains in that blank spot and the new card going into there will gain that money. Up to this point, all we've really spoken about are these court cards, which are the ones that have actions, impact icons, suits and ranks, etc. But there is another type of card in Pax Pamir, and that would be these event cards. Event cards have a distinct look from court cards. Namely, they have an if discarded text up top and a different kind of text on the bottom, in this case, until discarded. But many are when purchased. Unlike court cards, they never enter your hand and they never enter your tableau. Instead, they are immediately resolved and either remain in effect for a few turns or are immediately discarded and not looked at again for the rest of the game. In this case, this card is sort of a money sink. It cannot be purchased and any money that would get put on it in the market is instead removed from the game. So it represents a uh, public withdrawal. Many cards, however, will have an effect if purchased by a player. In this case, if this card ends up in the end of the market row at the end of someone's turn, then you remove all tribes and armies in Punjab. 
and if purchased, makes it more difficult for empires to dominate this region, representing conflict fatigue. However, there is one more type of event card that is maybe the most important card in this game. You might remember it during setup, but it is the dominance check. And these cards are tied to winning the game and finishing the game. A dominance card functions very similarly to event cards. When purchased, the text is immediately resolved and then it is discarded. If it sits in the end of the market, it is also immediately resolved and then discarded. The big difference here is that the text is identical for these two, there are exactly four of them in the deck, and if there are ever two of them in the market at one time, both are discarded and one dominance check is immediately performed. As the game goes on, these coalition blocks will get placed out onto the map. They will either lay down, representing roads, or be stood up, representing armies. If this dominance card is played and a dominance check is performed, you will evaluate the number of blocks out on this map and determine if one of the three empires dominates this region. In order for that to happen, one empire must have four more blocks out in the map than both the other armies. Not combined, they are checked individually. So for example, if the British had four blocks out here and the Russians and the Afghans had zero, the British would be dominant when this gets played. However, if the Afghans in this case had even one block out here, the British would not be dominant because while they have four more blocks than the Russians, they only have three more than the Afghans, which prevents one empire from dominating. If an empire is to be found dominant, you're gonna do a couple of things. First, you're going to see if any player is loyal to that empire. In this example, this gray player is loyal to the British. If there are multiple players that are loyal to that empire, you have to check to see who has the most influence in that empire, who has the second most influence, and so on. That is gonna determine how many points each player scores. Whoever has the most influence will go ahead and get five victory points. The person with the second most influence will get three, and the person with the third most influence will get one. If there is a tie, you add together the two positions being fought over. So for example, if blue and gray both had the same amount of influence in the British, and they both had the most amount of influence in the British, they would be fighting over first place and second place. So you would take the five points from first place and the three points from second place and make eight. You then cut that in half and divide it equally amongst the players that are competing. So blue would get four points and gray would also get four points. Then if there was another player that had influence in the British, they would get the third place number of points, which would be one. Then following a successful dominance check, all coalition blocks are removed from the map. You then move on and continue playing the game. If, however, a dominance check is unsuccessful, meaning one empire does not have four more blocks more than the other two, the dominance check is then considered unsuccessful. Players will still score points, but it will not be based on influence. Instead, it is simply based on who has the most number of cylinders in play. As tribes, spies, or gifts. The player with the most gets three points, the player with the second most gets one point, and those are the only points that are distributed. Ties are broken in the same fashion as with a successful dominance check. If, after one of these checks, there is one player that has four or more points than the other players, the game immediately ends and that player claims victory. Additionally, if the fourth and final dominance card is removed from the game, the game also ends and then point totals are tallied and whoever has the most wins. If there is a tie in points at the end of the game, whoever has the most military ranks in their tableau will win the game. If that is still tied, Whoever has the most coins in their personal supply wins the game. And if by some measure that is still tied, you need to get into your kitchen and have a cook-off because whoever can make the best tastiest kebab will win the game. Any points earned in the final dominance check of the game will be doubled. And you will double this before you add and split any in the case of ties. 
Okay, so let's talk about ruling a region. In order to rule a region, you must have at least one tribe present and the most number of loyal units. In this case, a loyal unit is considered an army that is of the empire of which you are loyal and your tribes. So in this example, the gray player being loyal to the British has one tribe here, plus there's a British army, therefore they rule the region and would take this marker. If this British army was not here and they were the only tribe, they would still rule the region. However, if there was an army or any loyal unit of a different empire, they would not rule the region. And they would leave this in that. Ruling a region will do a couple of things. First, in order for a player to play cards into a region that is ruled by someone, they must pay that player rupees equal to the number of tribes of the ruling player. So in this case, to play a card into Herat, you must pay the gray player one rupee. This cost may be reduced or waived at that player's discretion. Additionally, if you rule a region, you are free to take the build action in that region if you have it in your tableau, and you may tax players that have cards in their tableau in that region. Another thing to keep in mind in Pax Pamir is how your spies can silence cards in other players' tableaus. When a card is silenced, it's considered to be held hostage. So for example, these Russian regulars over here could be held hostage if another player has more spies on that card than any other player. When a card is held hostage, that means that the actions on that card cannot be used unless the player with the spies is paid rupees equal to the number of spies on the card. Much like with paying money to the ruler of a region for playing a card, this may be reduced or waived at the owning player's discretion. One thing to note about hostages is that special actions can never be silenced. A special action is text in a black box on a court card. In a dominance check, the player with the most influence in the dominant empire is going to get the most points. As a reminder, influence is one for your loyalty dial, any patriot bands you have in your tableau, so these colored names, any loyalty prizes you've taken, which are gained by using the betray action on a card that has a colored band on the bottom. When it's betrayed, it is taken by the person performing the action and placed upside down in their player area. That will switch your loyalty and it provides influence to the empire that is noted on the bottom. And finally, any gifts that you may have purchased are considered to be worth one loyalty each. When it comes to moving units, armies must move along friendly roads. A road bridges two regions and the move action allows armies to move along that road. When it comes to spies moving, however, they move along tableaus that the players have set up and they are considered connected for the purpose of spy movement. So let's say for instance, these were the cards out in the game. This black spy with the move action could move to here or from this card it could move to here because these are considered next to each other and these would be next to each other. They can continue moving for every move action performed in any direction along any player's tableaus. You cannot battle units that share your loyalty. So if these two players are both tied to the Russians, you could not use Russian armies to kill the other player's tribe. However, that does not apply to spies. Okay, well, that is Pax Pamir 2nd Edition. Now, like I said at the outset, this is not a comprehensive overview of every single rule and every single exception that might come up. I hope that if you are new to the Pax series in general, this has given you a pretty good overview of what the series is like. And if you're new to Pax Pamir 2nd Edition, either from 1st Edition or from another Pax game, I hope you understand what this edition has to offer over the others. Now, this is a very good game. Some might even call it a great game. 
And I hope that this video will help you get into it a little more smoothly. And if you see my boy Dost Muhammad on your travels, throw him a coin for me and tell him what's up.